Thanks, Matt. That was really awesome. Um, let's see. Just look at my watch. Um, right. So th this slide says history of Zcash. Um, Matt just gave a bunch of great context that was much broader than what I'm going to end up talking about. So I'm going to kind of uh, zoom in on something that's um, maybe less exciting than, than you might hear at a lot of uh, cryptocurrency conferences that are often focusing on um, amazing potential designs and uh, you know the, the revolutionary nature of things. Um, but let me give some historical context first. Um, so this is from my perspective um, that, that, that complements uh, what Matt was just describing. So I came from a company called Least Authority, uh, where we were developing decentralized storage technology and also doing security audits of open source privacy technology. Um, and eventually, uh, folks from Least Authority uh, partnered with the Zero Cash scientists uh, and created the Zcash company, and that's how we got here. Um, but Early on, at least Authority, we were all very aware of Bitcoin uh, when it came out, and we were all very excited about it uh, for various reasons. But you know, one thing is it just um, hit a lot of the same technical buttons uh, that we were already focused on with decentralized, um, secure, peer-to-peer -peer storage systems. Um, so there's just kind of a natural technical affinity. But also, it was this new application, money, and it um, it seemed to be gaining momentum. So we were very excited about that. Uh, and pretty soon, we also heard about Ethereum. Ethereum was quite interesting to us because Bitcoin was sort of showing, hey, there's this new uh, sort of consen consensus system that's uh, self-reinforcing with incentives. This new design is possible, and it sort of blew people's minds. And then Ethereum uh, was like, you know, the, the second sample of the design space. And uh, it's kind of a, a nice sample because they just changed every possible design axis, you know? So it seemed like a little wild or crazy, but at least it's good to kind of have a range across the design space to see what happens. Um, so then shortly thereafter, we, we heard about zero coin and zero cash, and we were excited about those, and uh, eventually the company was formed. Um, so here's a bit more of a timeline, uh, kind of re repeating what I just said. Um, an, an interesting uh, historical point for me was going to real world crypto at the beginning of 2014. So that's where I saw Matt give a presentation about zero cash. Um, and that's also where I saw a, a presentation about Ethereum. Um, Another thing is I met somebody in person that I had been collaborating with a little bit online. Uh, his name was Strad, and uh, he was a person wearing a balaclava and black glasses the entire conference. Um, and so I knew I had, you know, uh, found the right community, basically. <laughs> um, so then by, by, you know, Later in 2014, it was pretty clear that we were going to do this partnership with the Zero Cash scientists and make this thing uh, a real thing people could use. Um, so the company was created in 2015, and we started uh, trying to make the uh, academic code base into a real product. By the beginning of 2016, we had a, like a public alpha people could experiment with. And by the end of 2016, we, we launched um, 1.0, which we call Sprout. Um, so now, here, here's just a bunch of dates with a bunch of releases. All of the 1.0 releases are uh, implementing the Sprout pro uh, protocol. Um, and this is over a time span of like a little less than a year and a half. And there's, uh, I think, 17 releases here. So. Um, our engineer, engineering team was very busy at making like rapid, small changes to adjust what we had deployed and make sure it was safe. Uh, and there's two that are like colored differently, um, the version strings and with a dash one. That means those are hot fixes. So there was an urgent issue or bug that we needed to sort of rush out 
a, a fix for um, on a short time span instead of our normal release schedule. Um, after all of those 1.0 Sprout releases, we've started releasing um, the overwinter releases, so those begin with 1.1. Um, and the first thing you might notice is that there were like 17 of these other Sprout releases. There were three releases for overwinter. Um, and that brings us to the present point, which is that horizontal line, um, which is today. And it's also basically the same day that overwinter activated. And if we move on, um, this is the future now. We see we have a few more releases coming up. Um, before sapling activates. So an interesting thing to notice is sort of the compression where we had many, many releases over a year and a half with Sprout. And now for these next upgrades, we just have a few releases um, sort of packed together. So one thing that was happening during, during this year and a half is in addition to um, uh, like uh, improving the, the existing Sprout client and repairing bugs and keeping that safe. Uh, in parallel, we were doing R&D and development for Sapling, um, which I hope you will hear about soon. Um, OK, so that's just kind of a tour of how uh, Zcash Company got formed. Um, and then kind of a, a one uh, visualization of um, what we've been doing uh, schedule-wise. So now the next part is my list of the funnest bugs that we've encountered uh, and fixed. Um, so this list is um, uh, chronological roughly from the time that flaws or bugs were repaired. and. I, th I think it's interesting to, to just go over these. So the first two were design flaws in the, um, in the original Sprout Zcash circuit design. The internal H collision vulnerability uh, was a weakness which if we had shipped, uh, it, I think it could have been the end of Zcash um, uh, because it would allow somebody with sufficient like pre-computation to reach a state where they could then counterfeit Zcash. Uh, the fairy gold attack was um, uh, a bit more of an annoyance or a nuisance that could trick some people into accepting something uh, as a payment from a, a malicious party when, in fact, uh, they would not be able to spend those funds later. Um, so then we launched the next bug, the 1718, uh, is something that wasn't really dangerous, but it was just embarrassing. So when we first launched, uh, the, the, the code ignored fees for any transaction with shielded transfers. So that meant miners uh, prioritized those in the lowest possible manner. And in fact, I think all of the miners running our default code would not mine uh, shielded transactions, but there were some miners who would. So you could make a shielded transfer, and it would, you would just have to wait a long, long time before it was confirmed. Uh, the next one, 1769, has the exciting um, warning symbol, uh, which means uh, it, uh, we treated it as like a security incident. So uh, we we're concerned that it could be something that could harm users on the production network. And so you know, we, we had like all hands on deck analyzing it and determining how to, uh, how to fix it. So that was a cache and validation, um, cache and validation bug. And so it would potentially allow um, a malicious party to um, uh, it, it, th th there could have been a preparatory step where um, a malicious party could get different nodes into a different state. So uh, they would have, um, yeah, like a d different cache state. And then after that point, they could issue a transaction that nodes would react to differently, which could lead to a chain split. Moving along, 1823 uh, was another embarrassing or annoyance bug where 
transactions uh, that needed to um, spend uh, multiple notes or spend two multiple output notes uh, couldn't be generated by the client. So uh, the user facing impact is if you tried to make a transfer, sometimes it would fail and you, as a user, you probably didn't know why and the workaround would be to just transfer multiple smaller amounts uh, in multiple transactions. So that's another uh, embarrassing bug where the, the shielded transfer technology that, that is so amazing that we've been bringing into production isn't actually working very well for users. Then we have a, another terrifying emergency bug, uh, which was a seg fault uh, uh, from remotely uh, generated transactions, which is super scary. Um, so it, it, you know, we didn't uh, investigate too far, but it could have led to a remote code ex uh, execution. Um, and that was a really interesting bug because uh, this is a case where we uh, misunderstood part of the Bitcoin priority system, uh, which is a sophisticated system for like uh, trying to determine which transactions to select for mining. Um, and it's also related to how fee estimation happens in Bitcoin Core. Um, and it turns out that there are, in, in the whole design of Bitcoin and also in the code base of Bitcoin, there are um, basically certain invariants that are maintained by the global code base or the global design. Uh, but if they're violated um, for specific components, then those components can fail. Um, so that was a great lesson to run into. Um, so moving along, when we get to the next four bugs, um, there's an interesting pat pattern here. So uh, 437 um, was what I call a near bug. So there was a, an edge case in the pairing system, which is like um, key to the ZK SNARK shielded transfer technology. Um, uh, and it turned out that this edge case was not exploitable in, in Zcash, but it was a case where we were just being protected by like higher layers, like uh, um, when deserializing a transaction, our deserialization would prevent the, the problematic condition from occurring, but a lower level component could be vulnerable to that. Um, Next, we have uh, uh, degraded network behavior. This is another example uh, where we misunderstood some of the uh, invariants and the networking part of Bitcoin. And we made a, a change that seemed sensible at the time, um, but it violated some of the, the timing assumptions about message order. And Next, we have a libsnark buffer overflow. So libsnark implements the ZK snark um, uh, technology. This uh, buffer overflow is, is something that's really dangerous, but again, it's something that we were protected from in a higher layer. And then the last one on this list is um, uh, a bug that was in the original design of Overwinter that we fixed uh, r before Overwinter like uh, was released into production. Um, so I, I think it's interesting to, to see all of these bugs happening and some of these are severe and know that um, you know, these are turning up in Zcash. Uh, there's likely to be new bugs as we move forward um, and there's likely to be severe bugs like this in other systems. Um, so rather than just focusing on uh, like the, 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 the big picture designs and um, innovations that people love to focus on, I think it's important to, to keep in mind that there's still like a lot of work that needs to go into making things safe. Uh, so, um, Safety and security have been a key focus for our company. Um, 
And so far I've been describing bugs in our releases and uh, how, how we've addressed them. Um, but we also need to have similar safety in how we do research and design for new protocols like Sapling. Um, so also it seems anecdotally like initially there were some really severe bugs like 738 at the top, which may have been a killer. And then some of these things like chain split vulnerabilities or um, seg fault vulnerabilities uh, and as we've moved on, it, so far it seems like we have fewer of those severe bugs on production and now we're starting to hit uh, what, are, what I am calling near bugs or pre-bugs. So uh, this would mean we're, we're discovering things that uh, aren't dangerous directly to users but could be dangerous if over time the system evolves such that some higher layer protection uh, is no longer available. Um, and we're beginning to repair uh, lower layers to make the whole thing more robust. Um, so I think as time goes on, so these, these kinds of bugs, uh, you know, may exist in the wild and may not be discovered for a while. And then once they're discovered, they may be exploited. And over time, I think we're going to see in a variety of systems that some of these uh, are going to have terrible consequences. So like Matt mentioned a case uh, with another coin where um, there was a, a, a flaw of that nature. Um, so I think so far we've focused a lot on this sort of base level safety of, of, of the code base. Uh, but as Matt brought up, if, uh, if it's not usable and it isn't being adopted, it has limited impact. So we're starting to turn our focus now more towards usability and adoption. Um, and uh, we, we, we want to have like a really clear feedback loop between usability and protocol design um, so that the two evolve together. All right, that's it. I, I wanted to give thanks especially to uh, the Zcash Foundation for, for putting this on, um, to Paige for helping me with these slides, and also in a lot of these cases, especially for the severe hotfix bugs, we've relied a lot on the broader community outside of the company to like analyze the problems and to deploy mitigations. So I really want to thank the, the larger community for keeping uh, Zcash safe. <laughs>